everyone. Welcome, welcome to today's presentation on weight inclusivity in healthcare, helpful or helpful, with Landry Weatherson Yarbrough, Jennifer Vidito, and Joanna Nolan. My name is Katie Bendel, and I'm a community outreach liaison for Eating Recovery Center and Pathlight Mood and Anxiety Center. And before we get started with today's presentation, we want to play a quick user tutorial for you of the platform to give you the best experience. So we'll play that now. Welcome to today's webinar. Please watch this brief tutorial to enhance your viewing experience. We have multiple engagement tools on the screen. We have the media player, which is where the presenter will appear, the Q&A box where you can ask questions for the presenter, the slide deck, and the presenter bios. Click the blue button to display the bio in full. To resize or reposition any box on your screen, you can click and drag, or you can use the icon on the top right to maximize. Click again to return to its original size. You can also click and drag any box to a different area of your screen. To hide the box altogether, click here, and then click the icon at the bottom of the screen to have it reappear. You may contact us by using the Contact Us icon here. If you wish to chat with other audience members, click the Attendee Chat icon. This feature will be available when the webcast is live. If at any time your screen freezes, please try refreshing your browser. Microsoft Edge and Google Chrome are the preferred browsers to view the webcast. At the end of the presentation, a box will pop up with continuing education instructions. Click here to be taken to our continuing education portal. When asked for the code, refer back to the code listed here. Thank you and enjoy the presentation. All right, so as the video mentioned, you will see a pop-up box appear at the end of the event. And for those looking to get your continuing education credits, please take a moment to fill out the self sign up form, enter the code provided in the pop-up box. And after completing the form, you'll receive a confirmation email from ERC Pathlight continuing education events that will contain a link to access the portal. And if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us at continuing.education at ercpathlight.com. Um, so again, I wanna say welcome and thank you um, to the Oklahoma Eating Disorders Association for partnering with ERC and Pathlight on this event. We are grateful to share in the opportunity for community education and connection alongside of them. Um, I did want to make a quick um, disclaimer here, if I can get my slides to go forward, um, about conflict of interest. Um, the authors whose names are listed immediate, immediately below disclose that they have no financial relationship and any amount that exists between the authors in control of the content and any eligible company. So we don't have any conflict of interest today. Um, and um, I did want to also just do a brief introduction about ERC and Pathlight um, for those that aren't familiar with us. Um, so ERC and Pathlight offers a full continuum of care for eating disorders, mood, anxiety, and trauma-related disorders from um, at-home or virtual intensive outpatient care all the way up to um, inpatient um, or in-person 24-hour care. Um, and we have 35 centers across the country plus nationwide virtual treatment. Um, I did want to mention, um, and I'll review this quickly, in addition to our treatment services, we do have a wide variety of free community resources. So I have a quick overview of some of those here. Um, events like this one occur all year round at local, regional, and national levels. Our Mental Note podcast offers stories, knowledge, and empowerment for those on their mental health journey or supporting someone who is. I also want to highlight our nearly 20 free virtual support groups for mental health, which are open to the community at large, so anyone can join. Um, if you or anyone you know might benefit from these resources, I encourage you to follow up with us at the email resources at ercpathlight.com. Um, 
And next, Melissa, are my slides moving forward? If they're not, please help me. <laughs> um, I did want to talk briefly about Oklahoma Eating Disorders Association. So um, Jolene Wilson, who's an OEDA board member, is here with us. She cannot get her camera to work today, so I told her I would just share a little bit about OEDA's mission and kind of the work that they're doing. So OEDA is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to the prevention of disordered eating, eating disorders, and negative body image by raising awareness, providing education, and serving as the leading resource of support and identification of treatment resources throughout Oklahoma and neighboring states. Um, you can find more information about their website, which I've listed there. They are an amazing organization to partner with. It's been such a joy getting to know Jolene and working alongside of her. Um, I did want to tell you to check out their website and look at their upcoming events. Um, so they have a really cool fall symposium happening on November 3rd um, in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. And then they also have their Walking with Worth event happening December 2nd. That's also in Oklahoma. Um, and so I just want to extend on behalf of Jolene and OEDA an invitation to both of those events. And again, please go check out their website to learn a little bit more about those events if you're interested. Okay, and now I do want to introduce our speakers um, really quickly. So I'm really excited to introduce you to um, Joanna Nolan, who is an Eating Recovery Center alum and Recovery Ambassador Council member. Um, so after struggling with an undiagnosed eating disorder for the majority of the majority of her life, Joanna is driven to help destigmatize and educate her community through vulnerability and transparently sharing her story. She is passionate about the need for public awareness, education, and proactive treatment of eating disorders and mental illness in general. And Landry Weatherston Yarborough is the executive director at Eating Recovery Center and Pathlight Mood and Anxiety Center. She received her Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Texas Christian University and her Master of Education in Counselor Education from Texas Tech University. After initially working with survivors of domestic violence, Landry joined Eating Recovery Center in 2012 and has held many roles within the organization as primary therapist, clinical manager, clinical director, and then re most recently was made executive director in 2022. She's a founding member and current immediate past president of the San Antonio chapter of the International Association for Eating Disorder Professionals, um, IADEP. Landry became a certified eating disorder specialist supervisor through IADEP in 2019. And lastly, Jennifer Vidito is our regional nutrition director at Eating Recovery Center. Jennifer received her degree in nutrition from the University of Texas at Austin in 2005 and completed a dietetic internship in North Carolina in 2006. She then went into private practice as a registered dietitian and later joined Eating Recovery Center in 2015. Jennifer has an incredible passion to work with patients in higher levels of care and be part of an interdisciplinary team. In 2021, she became a nutrition director of Eating Recovery Center Southern Region. So I am so appreciative. Thank you, Joanna, Landry, and Jennifer, um, each of you for joining us today and sharing all of your um, wisdom and um, experience. I'm so excited to have you here. So um, with that, I believe I'll go ahead and pass it off to Joanna to share a little bit about her story. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. And as mentioned, I am an ERC alum as well as a recovery ambassador council member for ERC Pathlight. And to understand and to know my story and my journey, we've got to obviously start at the beginning. So I would love if everybody could just close their eyes for a second. I would love if you could just picture a little girl, picture a little girl around the age of five she has strawberry blonde hair, ringlets, blue eyes. She has pink frame glasses with little silver ducks on the side. She's full of joy and laughter and love. She loves playing My Little Ponies with her sister. She loves baking cookies with her mom. Now imagine that little girl standing on the playground at school. Imagine her surrounded by her classmates being called Bola Blubber, fat, thick, 
four eyes, hippo. Imagine that inner light being blown out like a candle. Now open your eyes. That little girl is me. My story started when I was five years old. Um, I was constantly made fun of for not being the same size as the other girls, kids in my class, for wearing glasses, for being different. And weight was always a big focus in my family as well as my pediatrician. From a very young age, I was it was instilled with in with in me for me to be accepted and worthy of love and friendships and worthy of a happy and healthy life. I needed to be thin and to look like everybody else for me to be accepted. It was also a big focus amongst my um, parents and pediatrician that if I didn't get my weight under control, that I would grow up to have diabetes or other um, medical conditions associated with being overweight. Um, so from a very young age, I was introduced to dieting, watching what I ate, um, the idea of having bad food and good food, um, putting food and different types of food on pedestals, um, the increase of focus around exercise and activity and being in sports or not being in sports and what that could do to my body. Um, and I was prescribed diet medication at a very young age. Um, and uh, move forward, fast forward to high school, this, the make, getting made fun of, having weight being such a big focus, um, continued on through my adolescence into high school. When I graduated high school, I decided that I was done being that girl. I was done being the girl that didn't get asked to dances, that wasn't included into certain um, friend groups or cliques in high school because of the way I looked or the way I didn't look. Um, I was just done with it. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to feel validated. I wanted to feel like I was enough. And that led to me deciding, okay, I'm going to take control of my body. I'm going to take steps into my hands and I'm going to make myself healthy. Like everybody has been telling me since I was a little kid. So I started to watch what I ate. I started to exercise with my mom and watching what I ate and exercising led to me losing weight. Me losing weight led to me being validated by people around me. And that fueled my want to lose even more weight. So I started to increase my exercise and I started to increase my restrictions. And I, dis I discovered that if I took certain foods away um, or limited myself on what I ate, weight came off faster and I became obsessed with it. Um, I became obsessed with calorie counting and I became obsessed with exercise. Um, it was consuming, but at no point was it ever cause for concern to my parents, my pediatrician, my doctors, because I wasn't underweight. Um, I was actually just seen as being healthy and that I was taking control of my life, that I was um, doing what I needed to do to make sure that I wasn't going to be a diabetic, that I wasn't going to have these medical conditions, that I was going to be in the best shape of my entire life. And this continued on through college. Um, and as the years progressed, I discovered more and more things that um, I discovered that if I started taking diet medication, um, weight would come off faster. I started to become dependent and consumed by taking laxatives, diuretics. Um, I discovered other compensatory behaviors. And, as, and I also discovered that if I continued to restrict calories and food intake and increased my exercise, that the weight would continue to come off. And I became so consumed and so involved with that that it, was, it ran my entire life. Um, it wasn't until college, I was sitting in class one day and I got this insane pain in my stomach. And I called my mom and she said, go to the emergency room, I'll meet you there. So I drove myself to the emergency room and the doctor came in and asked my parents to leave. And he asked me questions and he was like, what have you eaten today? 
And I told him what I had eaten. And he said, is this a normal thing for you? And I said, well, yeah, you know, this is my normal, this is normally what I eat in a day. And he was like, okay. And that was the first time that I had heard the words, you know, have you ever been diagnosed with an eating disorder? Have you ever, you know, has this ever been a part of your medical background, your history? And I was like, eating disorder? I don't have an eating disorder. I'm not underweight. I'm healthy. I'm in shape. Like I'm in the best shape of my life. Um, I'm at my lowest weight that I ever have been. Um, but still, all of that to be considered, I was still not underweight. I still was not being, it wasn't a red flag to even him in the ER. It wasn't a red flag to my normal primary care. It wasn't a red flag to my parents. I wasn't underweight. I didn't have, you know, test come back as being flagged for any type of anything um, that would have been a flag to somebody with an eating disorder. And so I was sent on my way and basically the doctor said, just make sure that you continue to have a substantial amount of food in your stomach. Otherwise this will continue to happen. Um, and I went on my way and continued to do my thing, continued to do my restrictions, continued to do my obsession with exercise, continued to do my laxative and diabetic or my diuretic use. And fast forward a couple years, um, and I was diagnosed with IBS. And I was so scared at that point that I had done severe damage by the amount of laxative use that I had done, by the diuretics, by the calorie restrictions, by the obsessiveness with my exercise. I was starting to finally become aware and concerned that the many years that I had lived this life um, had started to take a toll on my body. And I was like, there's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be more to my life than counting my calories, being completely consumed every single day with what I was going to allow myself to eat, what I was going to give my permission, myself permission to do at the gym, or if I could actually hang out with people or see my family versus go for a run. Um, it just ran my life. And I was just like, there's got to be more to my life than this. I want more. I'm worthy of more. And I went to my primary care doctor and he said, why are you here today? And I just broke down. I completely broke down and it was just the floodgates had opened. And I had told him everything that had happened, everything that I had done over the years, how long it had been happening um that it was never addressed by any medical professional that i never had sought treatment um and he said okay this is out of my realm um i'm going to refer you to a cognitive therapist and we'll go from there he referred me to a cognitive therapist same thing i showed up at her office she said why are you here floodgates opened i unleashed everything and she kind of looked at me the same way that he did and was like i'm gonna refer you to erc they um are specialists in this area and i feel like they are the best place to tackle all of this and to get to the root of all of this it sounds like you have had and do have an eating disorder and so i um, was referred to erc and I had my assessment and two weeks later I started IOP. Um, I was in the IOP program for three months. Um, I was determined to completely surrender myself to ERC, to the process, to the professionals. Um, I was completely terrified. I'll never forget my very first night in program. I walked through those doors and I did not feel like I belonged there. Um, I felt like I didn't have an eating disorder. I didn't look um, physically the way that some of the other patients looked. Um, I didn't feel like I was even good enough at my eating disorder to warrant me to have treatment. Um, it was definitely a struggle. I didn't feel sick enough. I, I got in my head as far as, you know, I didn't need inpatient treatment. Therefore I'm not as sick, um, and shouldn't be here. Um, I don't need treatment. I don't deserve treatment. And thankfully after getting through those three months and, um, transitioning finally out of IOP. I continued to do outpatient treatment with a dietitian and my therapist for five years. And um, 
and then continued on with just a therapist two years after that. And it actually is just recently that I have stopped seeing my therapist. Um, I'm in the best place mentally that I have been since I was a little kid. Um, and I can finally say like, I am the happiest that I've been. I am able to connect with people and be present with people and is weight still a thing? Do I feel still feel like, um, you know, there's a focus around that? Obviously, you know, in our society, there's such a huge emphasis and there's such a big focus on weight and being thin and now being associated with if you're overweight, you have these medical conditions um, or could have these medical conditions. And obviously that is always there in the back of my mind, but that doesn't stop me from living my life. And now I get to be an ambassador and I get to do speaking engagements, which I'm extremely passionate about. And I'm very transparent with my story because one of the things that I struggled with was not feeling like I ever belonged and not feeling like I deserved to be a part of having a recovery journey or having a recovery story to tell because I didn't think people would believe me that I had a story to tell. And it was really important to me that if I'm transparent with my story, that maybe somebody that is on the receiving end that maybe is struggling or hasn't even started their journey, hasn't taken that first step, feels some kind of connection to my story and they feel like they're heard and that they're not alone. And if I can reach one person, um, then I have done my part. And so I'm so thankful to be here and I owe, you know, everything to ERC um, as well as, you know, my own personal dedication to my recovery. Um, it's been really important to me and um, I feel like it's very important to be your own advocate and that's why I'm here. So. Thank you, Joanna, for sharing. That was incredible. I was seeing a lot of little heart reactions coming up from the audience. So I think they're sending you lots of appreciation and love. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to tell everyone that we actually did an interview with Joanna on our Mental Note podcast. And so if you do want to hear more about her story, or if you know someone who might appreciate hearing her story, you can find that. Um, I put a link to it in the chat. I put a link to her specific episode. Um, but thank you again, Joanna. We appreciate you. Um, and with that, I guess we'll pass it off to Landry. Oh, yeah, one more thing. I forgot to say, if you do have questions for any of the presenters, please put them in the Q&A because we will have time for questions um, at the very end. So any questions for Joanna, Jennifer, or Landry? All right, now I'll pass it off. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so I'm gonna take the first part of this presentation where we talk about diet culture that Joanna shared that she grew up in and that we all live in. And what we mean by diet culture is that we live in the system of beliefs in our culture today that values weight, values shape, values size over health and well being. So the focus is more on the external versus on the internal, and really what is life giving. Ways that diet culture presents itself in our society today is that focus on calorie intake and food restriction. A lot of our patients at the Eden Recovery Center will come in and compare how many calories they were able to restrict and who ate the lowest amount of calories each day. And it's like a prize when, as Joanna was sharing, when somebody doesn't get enough nutrition, that doesn't lead to health and well-being. Other ways diet culture present itself include encouraging someone to ignore their body cues. It normalizes negative self-talk, like I'm so fat, I'm so overweight, I, I'm so obese, uh, I should go run 10 miles because I ate this dessert. 
all of that is acceptable in the broader culture today. There's labels also that are placed on good, on foods that declare food is good or bad. When I would work with patients at the Eating Recovery Center as a dietitian, I would say, well, this food is bad? You're telling me it's bad? I said, did you pull it out of a dumpster? Did you get it out of the trash? Is it have mold on it? Like, is there something wrong with it? And they would look at me like I was crazy and they say, no, it's just, it's bad, it's unhealthy. And I would go, really, who says? So really those labels are just so prevalent. There's a sense of fat shaming and food shaming that is common in our culture today. There's an over-focus on fitness and being buff or cut or whatever term that is the latest term that social media is using today. There's multiple photo editing apps out there where people look different than what they look like in real life because of that value of weight and shape and size that is promoted. We associate worth with our food intake, with how much we exercise by the way that we look. It's a quote, good day if you stay within this number of calories, or it's a good day if you get up and exercise at four o'clock in the morning, but it's a bad day if you sleep in and it's the weekend and you're doing that as a way of caring for yourself. Other ways that diet culture present itself are things like when people compliment and promote weight loss, when they really may not know what's going on in that person's life, just like Joanna was sharing. The diet culture mentality promotes the orthorexic clean eating behaviors. I was recently talking with a father of a adolescent who went on this health journey and now she's at a point where she cannot eat at restaurants because she's not sure what they make their food with. She won't even use a microwave and she's debating, should she continue using an oven? It is that diet culture that starts promoting thoughts and ideas like those things that that adolescent has been wondering and considering. And there's tons of more examples. I bet we could each share an example of something that we've heard that is diet culture related that promotes itself as health and good when really it's something that's really against overall health and well being. So it's all around. One of my <laughs> quote favorite uh, diet culture things that I'm seeing when I, that's, when I say that I'm being sarcastic is what does so-and-so eat in a day? Like what uh, celebrity eats in a day? I've seen like, what does Taylor Swift eat in a day? What does Jennifer Aniston eat in a day? And when I look at that, I go, well, what does it matter? Um, I mean, why is what, however they're eating the quote right way to eat just because they're celebrities. So we can't escape it. It's all around us, whether we're driving, whether we're watching TV, whether we're on our phones, there's no escaping. So how should we live in this culture in a way that promotes health being a variety of different things and looking a variety of different ways? So here's why we and when I say we at ERC, us clinicians at ERC really do not recommend dieting. We, we don't believe in diets because the reality is, is they don't work long-term. The evidence is there at least 95%, if more, if not more people quote, fail at a diet, eventually diets are not sustainable because they don't teach you how to feed yourself for the long term. And sometimes life changes and your necessary food behaviors change with it. Diets also set people up for potential binging behaviors and other eating disorder behaviors because they teach you how to lose touch over time 
with your body's normal cues. They're often based in this punishment of yourself and disgust. So there's this mental health component to them that leads to a lot of guilt and shame. And diets tend to promote this idea that if you deprive yourself, that makes you better. Or maybe it makes you better than the other person because you're more in control. And people who may see you dieting may say things like, oh, I wish I had your, your ability to be so self-controlled around food. When really that person saying that may have no idea of the dark side that is going on behind the scenes scenes with those diet behaviors. Diets can lead to overall long-term concerns with your physical health because it can be hard on a person's heart and vital organs to lose weight and regain it. That weight cycling has been shown to really be something that actually does not promote health. It actually decreases a person's health and potential lifespan. Diets also lead to social challenges because they often lead to a more restricted life along with a restrictive food intake because they cause a person to put their life on hold or avoid certain things that used to be normal in life. For example, maybe they're afraid to go over to a person's house for a party because they're not quite sure what foods will be there or they they get anxious about going to a restaurant because they're not sure how many calories are in the food or any concerns that they may not be able to eat like the other people are eating. And then diets as well are often nutritionally inadequate and sometimes even dangerous like Joanna was sharing. And oftentimes diets can just become progressively more and more dangerous if this, the diet behaviors continue because it takes more and more restriction to keep losing weight and keep getting that quote positive affirmation of people saying, oh, wow, you're continuing to lose weight. You're looking even better than you did two weeks ago. And then lastly, diets encourage people to think of food as good or bad. When food is a a morally neutral object and bananas or apples or whatever food never decided that it should be labeled as good, it should be labeled as bad. All food is food that somebody can choose to eat or not eat and eat according to taste preference. So a little bit more about the physical consequences of dieting. Diets can cause a person's metabolism to decrease. It can lead to poor digestion, constipation, just GI upset and dysregularity. It can cause somebody to lack energy, maybe even feel a bit depressed because of that lack of energy. I get just kind of beside myself when I see advertisements for supplements that say, oh, this will just help increase your energy so much. But I'm thinking as a dietitian, there's no way it can do that if there's not food alongside it because food is our only source of energy. Diets can also lead to difficulty sleeping. If we are undernourished, our bodies have this amazing way of trying to keep us awake in hopes that we'll feed it as it's needed as the body needs that nutrition. So it can make sleep very challenging. And diets actually can lead the body to start storing more fat because the body doesn't know what's going on externally. The body doesn't know that this is a choice the person is making versus a necessity. So the body wants to go into protection mode store the reserves of energy that is fat to help keep the person alive longer. Diets also reduce our muscle tissue, including our vital organs. For those patients that come to the ERC at our higher levels of care, like inpatient and residential levels of care, we run initial blood work and 
there, and we also run some other tests like EKGs and things like that, DEXA scans, and we'll see that there has been damage done due to the heart, to a person's bones, to a person's kidneys, like you name it, and most importantly, the brain. So that can be a consequence of dieting. It also leads to lower body temperature, more cold intolerance, it decreases hormone productions and immune system functioning because if there's only a certain amount of energy and nutrition coming in, the body's going to create this hierarchy of needs and say, okay, I need the energy coming in to keep the heart pumping, the lungs breathing, the kidneys filtering. Hormones, while nice, aren't vital. So we're not gonna send energy to do that skill or the immune system, that's nice, but it's not essential. So we're not gonna send energy to do that. So it can lead to a lesser level of well being. It can cause somebody to become sick with colds, things like that more often. It can cause a female potentially to lose regular menstrual cycles, which then creates bone health concerns. Dieting can also lead to brittle hair and nails, dry skin, and like I just mentioned, the decreased bone density. So if you think about it, this is the reality of dieting, yet the diet culture around us is saying, in a sense, it's the best thing ever. So the messaging is not in alignment with the reality. And in addition to all of these physical consequences, there's also psychological consequences of dieting, which are severe, just like the physical consequences of dieting are. Some of the psychological consequences of dieting that people may experience are things like mood disturbance, depression, feeling irritated, agitated easily, harder to shift gears and make adjustments and and, and be flexible. It increases their obsessiveness about food and weight. Some of our patients who went on diets and then those diets turned into eating disorders, they become immaculate chefs in that process. They used to not really spend a ton of time in the kitchen, really could do a million other things before they spent time cooking if they had a choice. But with the dieting behaviors as they increased, they became very obsessed with recipes, with cooking, with making these elaborate meals and things like that. Other psychological consequences include increases in feelings of compulsion and pressure. Then there's also body image distortion, poor self image. Oftentimes there's more difficulty in thinking and concentrating because that nutrition is not there to help the brain do what it's designed to do. Those food cravings often increase. Those desires to go back to those foods you used to love tend to, no pun intended, eat away at the person. And it often leads to also isolation along with feelings of guilt and shame and eventually failure. So overall, there are quite a few harming effects that diet culture leads to. It causes physical consequences, psychological consequences. It can lead someone down the path of disordered eating and potentially a full-blown eating disorder. It overtakes a person's thoughts. It often costs them quite a bit of money and quite a bit of time. They off, people often lose their sense of joy because they stop doing things that give them a sense of excitement and, and just that of life in general. And then that guilt and that shame comes in. There's often this punishment mentality of if you don't do this with food or if you don't do that with exercise, then you should punish yourself. You should feel horrible. It makes relationships more complicated and it destroys your relationship with food. So lots of negative impacts. 
So why does this matter to us as clinicians? Well, here's why. The normalization of diet culture masks the fact that nearly 10% of people in the U.S. are suffering from an eating disorder. Up to 28 million people of all ages, races, and ethnicities and genders suffer from eating disorders in the United States. Eating disorders have one of the highest mortality rates of any mental illness. 90% of American women are dissatisfied with their appearance, and up to 85% of men are dissatisfied satisfied with their muscularity. And that percentage of men has just continued to increase over time. 80% of 10 year olds are afraid of becoming fat. 40% of first graders to third grade girls say they wanna be thinner. And 40% of nine to 11 year olds are sometimes or very often on diets and 80% of their families are sometimes or very often on diets. That, that are, that's some really shocking statistics. And especially for those younger kiddos, like if you think about it, like in first grade, third grade, or even middle school, like there's so many more things that could give life and provide enjoyment and value to focus on versus getting so rigid about what you're eating or how you're exercising. So we as clinicians are not immune to promoting diet culture though. So we need to be mindful of it just like anybody else in our culture. If we want to promote a change, if we want to promote more of a body equality, if we want to promote actually overall health and well being for everyone. And here's how clinicians may be susceptible to promoting diet culture. Clinicians may intentionally try to limit weight gain in people in normal or larger bodies because they're looking at just the numbers. Clinicians may set target weights based on BMI or Hamway, ideal body weight versus weight history. Something that not all that long ago, because we didn't have a better standard at that time, is for anybody 21 years of age or younger, we would say if we can get them to the 50th percentile of BMI for age, then that will help them maintain health. But now we know that that actually may not be appropriate for some young adults or children because they may have a weight history that was higher than the 50th percentile. And there's nothing wrong with that if that was their norm for their life up to that point. Clinicians may also promote diet culture by recommending weight loss surgery and they can reinforce eating disorder thoughts and rules and beliefs, just like Joanna shared. Like clinicians may say, oh, well, you don't look like you have an eating disorder when we know eating disorders look so many different ways and come in all different sizes of bodies. Clinicians may also give a generic meal plan that doesn't account for a patient's size or reported hunger a, a little personal story. My mom called me up last week and she said, you're going to be so proud of me. I'm starting on this diet and I won't name the name. And I'm like thinking in the back of my head, you have no idea <laughs> what I'm like. I'm not that all, all that excited, but I just remain neutral and go, uh-huh, tell me about it. And she goes, well, I was so hungry the other day. And I said, well, are, do they have you on a certain calorie amount? She goes, yeah. 1400 calories. And I said, mom, no wonder you're hungry. Like that's hardly anything for a woman of your size and age and lifestyle. Um, and she thought like, really? And I'm like, mom, how long have you known me? <laughs> Only my entire life. Um, so there's no such thing as a generic meal plan. And we may actually be reinforcing that idea of restricting or limiting your intake for the purpose of just looking a certain way. Clinicians can also get into that trap of promoting, encouraging, congratulating weight loss. I'm sure 
most of us, if not all of us, have been reading and hearing about the Ozempic craze and the similar types of drugs. There's lots of focus on weight loss related to those right now. And that weight loss is taking the focus versus maybe the health benefits those drugs could be providing to some people. Clinicians can also minimize a patient's self-report of food intake. They may look at someone in a larger body and go, well, there's no way that they're eating, quote, that little. That, that's impossible. They, so they're making judgments just based off of a person's size when they have no idea what's going on day to day. Clinicians, dietitians have been known for the, doing this. They'll promise a patient or reassure a patient that they won't get overweight or they won't get fat. When in reality, we don't have direct control over the scale. We have a lot of scientific research that tells us how to go about caring for patients with eating disorders and helping them restore appropriate amounts of body weight. But we can't make that promise because we ultimately aren't in control of their food intake or what their bodies want to land at weight wise. And then sometimes just the way that our clinical office buildings are set up, they don't always support people in larger bodies. Chairs are uncomfortable. Even scales may be too small if weighing is necessary and it all the little things can make somebody who's in a bit of a larger body feel like they don't belong and then clinicians can use language that is viewed as negative or harmful like obese overweight things like that that can lead to a sense of lower self-esteem So what we tend to be raised with knowing about people in larger bodies are things like this. If we would just teach them more, then they would lose weight. If they would just listen, they would be healthier. If they would just be more compliant, they could have the body that they want to have. If they would just make better choices, then life would be better for them. They would finally have that relationship that they're, they've always wanted. When, when did food equal a relationship or not? If they would just tell the truth, then they could actually get help. So these are all judgments that clinicians and society at large can place on people in larger bodies that is inappropriate and absolutely unfair. Because here's the reality. It is a myth that fat causes disease. That is a completely false statement. So the focus on obesity and it being a crisis in our culture today, the focus is not on what it needs to be. There are several diseases that may be associated with obesity, but that does not mean that fat causes disease. There are so many confounding factors that play a role in disease incidents beyond a person's body size, their cardiovascular fitness, their, dis the discrimination they face can play an absolute role in disease incident. Dieting, like we talked about, that weight cycling can lead to disease and unhealthiness, stress, can promote a lot of different health consequences. A person's quality of relationships or lack thereof can have an impact on their health. Their socioeconomic st status can absolutely have an impact on their health. And the list can go on and on. Our society often likes to try to simplify things and, and the way that they're doing this in diet culture is that, well, if a person would just lose weight, they would be healthier or they would be less susceptible to long-term disease. When that is not true, it's so much larger. There's so many more factors involved in disease and, and health. 
So really here is what a person's weight can be attributed to. So many different factors. Yes, food has a role, exercise has a role, but there's so many other things that also play a role in a person's body size. Genetics being probably the one that has the most impact on somebody's weight, but environment, emotional state, even prenatal maternal factors that we had no control over play, could play a role in a person's weight. Social and cultural influences can play a role. Hunger physiology can play a role. Lifestyle habits amongst many other things. So it's helpful to consider that there's so much more than what is presenting itself on the surface and to work as clinicians or healthcare providers, or just even as neighbors on that weight neutrality and that weight inclusivity, because that type of mentality can actually promote better health and well-being for the culture at large. Thank you so much, Jennifer, um, for a fabulous description of the first um, kind of section of our presentation this evening. I'm going to wrap us up with the second part of our um, presentation and really take a look at what does it mean to have a weight inclusive approach. Joanna spoke very eloquently about her experiences of a lack of a weight inclusive approach and how that's impacted her across her life. Um, and Jennifer made a very strong case for why it's important for us to be aware of diet culture. So we're gonna kind of put the pieces together and see really what does it look like for us to take a step toward weight inclusivity as clinicians. Um, and then we'll save some time at the end for Q&A as well. So the kind of gold standard of weight inclusive approaches to health is health at every size. Um, health at every size is um, an approach that was developed by Lindo Bacon um, and has since been um, adopted by the Association for Size Diversity and Health. Um, and it's a really kind of a groundbreaking, I think in a lot of ways, um, approach to thinking about people's bodies, thinking about weight, thinking about size and how that interplays um, with healthcare and health at every size, or it's abbreviated HAES, um, H-A-E-S, you see that down at the lower part of the screen. Um, hey, a HAES approach is something that ERC is uh, very aligned with. We look at uh, health at every size as kind of the indicator of how we think about our patients who are in larger bodies and even our patients who aren't in larger bodies. Um, and that health at every size is a much more nuanced and multifaceted approach than, um, you know, kind of finding your height and your weight on the BMI chart and figuring out what, you know, color section you fall in. You know, are you in the green zone? Are you in the red zone? Um, that just, you know, really, for all the reasons Jennifer talked about, really doesn't work um, as well as, as people like to believe that it does. So the goal of Hayes is to accept and respect the natural diversity of body sizes and shapes. So as we've heard already, bodies come in all different sizes and shapes and naturally that's a good thing. But when we're exposed through diet culture to bodies only looking a certain kind of way, we start to internalize that bodies should only look a certain kind of way. And if our bodies don't look that way, that there's something wrong and that we need to do something about it to correct it, so to speak. Hayes, with this respect toward a diversity of body sizes and shapes, um, has goals to teach people to eat in a flexible manner, um, focusing on enjoyment while also honoring internal hunger and fullness cues. Oftentimes we find that our eating disorder patients are very disconnected from their hunger fullness cues as a result of their eating disorder behaviors. And Hayes also removes the focus from weight and treats the whole person, including physical, psychological, and emotional well-being. So that real holistic approach that 
you know, the number on the scale is not the whole story of who you are and how you're doing um, in terms of your health. You know, Joanna talked about that exact experience that she was like, hey, the number on the scale is great. That means I'm totally healthy. Um, you know, and that provider was able to help support her in, in starting to challenge some of those thoughts and increasing awareness around that. Um, and so the Hayes approach seeks to do the same thing with the public at large. And Hayes also seeks to show the divide between health and body weight and size. Um, it's researched back. And so it's not just about being more compassionate. I think that's one of the critiques of Hayes is that it's kind of this, um, you know, feel good, fluffy approach. When in reality, Hayes is really about supporting improved healthy behaviors for people of all sizes without using weight as a mediator. So um, we're gonna get into some more details about Hayes, but it's really, an, I think, an impressive body of research when you start to kind of dig, um, dig in deeper and see the differences. Um, because certainly as, as clinicians who treat people with eating disorders, we have lots of clinical experiences to show that just because somebody weighs a certain um, weight doesn't necessarily mean that they're um, healthy, quote unquote. Um, and although our patients often feel healthy at certain sizes or don't feel healthy at certain sizes, um, the Hayes approach actually gives us a lot more um, detail and a lot more support for looking at what's right for the person as a unique being. So like I mentioned, there's a lot of misconceptions about health at every size. It's easy to kind of paint with a wide brush and um, lose some of those nuances. So some of the critiques or misbeliefs around health at every size is that it's anti-weight loss and anti-health. Um, people think that Hayes uh, is positing that exercise and nutrition doesn't impact health, which is not the case. Um, it's criticized as being anti-science and anti-medical nutrition therapy. Um, another misconception is that everyone is healthy regardless of their weight. Hayes practitioners can't work with people who desire weight loss and that it's just for people in larger bodies. So again, everything on this slide is false. So um, do take note of that. But these are a lot of kind of the stories and the misinformation and the myths that are out there around Hayes that can get people um, confused. I think it can um, create some strong reactions in people, um, especially our patients. You know, if we're if we're working from a health at every size approach and and, and we're maybe telling our patients that you know I'm a health at every size clinician um, or I'm aligned with health at every size in my practice. Um, and I have a patient who like, you know, Joanna, for example, was really, um, her eating disorder was really tied up in her exercising behaviors. And they think, oh my gosh, you're not gonna let me exercise anymore. You don't believe that exercise is okay. Or, um, right, that that kind of rearing back um, shock factor can really get in the way of rapport building with patients. And so it's important, I think, for us to be aware of what are the misconceptions that are out there so that we can proactively address them um, and make sure that we're uh, all on the same page as we're getting started. There's, um, you know, these five kind of principles from Health at Every Size. So weight inclusivity is there in the center. And then we have the principles of health enhancement, respectful care, eating for well-being, and life-enhancing movement. When we look at weight inclusivity, um, it's really talking about weight neutrality. So breaking apart the idea that what you weigh is an automatic indicator of how healthy or unhealthy you are, or that in order to be healthy, to say it another way, that you have to be a certain weight. So this the kind of stance is that we must accept and respond to the inherent diversity of body shapes and sizes and reject the idealizing or pathologizing of specific weights. So not only would we say that like, oh, that's the perfect weight, that that would be um, problematic for a weight inclusive perspective, but also to say that that person is overweight. Um, even the word obese is one that we tend not to use from a health at every size perspective 
because of the the judgment and kind of the emotionally laden history that that word brings with it. So a lot of times you'll hear haze aligned practitioners using terms like higher weighted or larger bodied, smaller weighted um, or lower weighted, smaller body, things like that are just a little bit more neutral and factual. The second principle is health enhancement. Um, in health enhancement, this is the one I think that surprises most people about health at every size, because again, there's that bio, bias um, that, um, you know, that we're not, we're not, we're anti-exercise or whatnot. So in health enhancement, um, supporting health policies that improve and equalize access to information and services and personal practices that improve human well-being, including attention to individual, physical, economic, social, spiritual, emotional, and other needs. So there's this real focus on the whole person versus just this one aspect of the person. And so when you compare and contrast Hayes versus traditional weight loss paradigms, it's really kind of so starkly different. Um, in a traditional weight loss paradigm, it's everyone needs to be thin in order to be healthy and happy. Um, and, you know, thinner is better, essentially. And at health at every, a health at every size perspective, um, it challenges that by saying thin's not intrinsically healthy and beautiful, nor is that intrinsically unhealthy and unappealing. One of the things I love about health at every size is that it really tackles the beliefs um, and the biases that diet culture has brought us kind of from both ends. Um, and I think it, it then allows us to be better positioned to kind of move forward. Another example is that traditionally um, a weight loss paradigm would say that people who aren't, who are not thin are overweight because they don't have enough willpower, eat too much, don't move enough, all those things that Jennifer was talking about before. At, from a Hayes perspective, people naturally have different body shapes and sizes and different preferences for physical activity. And so the whole range of body diversity is, is, is right. In traditional weight loss paradigms, everyone can be thin, happy, and healthy by dieting. Um, and health at every size challenges that as well and says that dieting usually leads to weight gain, decreased self-esteem, um, and an increased re risk for disordered eating, as Jennifer discussed as well. The third principle is eating for well-being. What this looks like is having an all-foods-fit approach, um, or food neutrality is another way to talk about that. Um, we're not demonizing or glorifying any food. We're not saying that that's a good food versus a bad food, um, that this is a food that is healthy or unhealthy. Oftentimes patients who have eating disorders have very kind of polarized thought processes. And so it's easy for them to get stuck in those dynamics of good and bad, um, healthy, unhealthy, yes and no foods. Um, and so when we eat for well-being. It's uh, the goal is to promote flexible, individualized eating based on hunger, satiety, nutritional needs, and pleasure, rather than any externally regulated eating plan focused on weight control. And I love that it includes pleasure because so much of our society is around food as a celebration or as a way to connect with other people. Joanna talked about making cookies with her mom. Um, and there's such a pleasurable aspect to food, and that's often left out of the traditional um, diet perspectives. Respectful care is another premise of Hayes. Um, and if you can't see the, the, the little cartoon here, the woman is saying, doctor, I've been impaled. And the doctor is saying, well, maybe you'll feel better if you lose some weight. And that I think is so true and, and again shows up in Joanna's story that oftentimes the, the focus of our current healthcare system is on weight loss and that weight loss is the solution for just about everything. Um, there's a lot of research that shows that higher body patients receive different treatment at doctors when they present with the same symptoms as lower bodied or lower weighted patients in smaller bodies. And so it's a default response in our medical system to prescribe weight loss to larger bodied people. 
And so in respectful care, we work to acknowledge our biases and work to end weight discrimination, weight stigma, and weight bias. Provide information for and services from an understanding that socioeconomic status, race, gender, sexual orientation, age, and other identities impact weight stigma and support environments that address these inequities. I was actually just having a conversation today um, in a supervision session with a therapist, um, and she was talking about this exact uh, scenario with one of her patients, that her patient had gone to the doctor and the doctor said, well, you just need to lose some weight. Um, and so I actually pulled this, this cartoon up and showed her and I said, you know what, this is so unfortunately common that people are making cartoons about it. It's such a ubiquitous experience and it speaks to the pervasiveness of, of diet culture and weight bias. And then life enhancing movement is the last premise of Hayes supporting physical activities that allow people of all sizes, abilities, and interests to engage in enjoyable movement to the degree that they choose. And so it really breaks apart this idea of, are you moving joyfully or are you moving compulsively? Are you doing it because you feel like you have to? Or are you doing it because you think you have to burn off whatever you ate earlier in the day or you have to make up for some perceived caloric transgression? Um, are we moving our body for pleasure or for punishment and having that orientation towards your body, um, that it is a joyful activity to move your body. And maybe you don't like running on a treadmill, but maybe you really, really love Tai Chi, or maybe yoga is not your jam, but, uh, getting out, um, you know, on the lake and rowing is, is where it's at for you. And so playing around and figuring out what is joyful for you is a part of recovery for so many of our patients because the, the drivenness around exercise that people who have eating disorders can often experience um, is, is very rarely experienced as joyful post-recovery from what I've observed. So when following a... Um, you know, these, these kind of possible outcomes through, if we have a weight-centric approach versus a weight-inclusive approach like Hayes, a weight-centric approach would be kind of the traditional, you know, approach. Um, the, we find that a lot of healthcare providers um, just avoid the topic of weight altogether. Um, you know, so when they're not, uh, they're not talking about it with their patients because it can be uncomfortable. And the flip side is also true. If I am going to the doctor and I expect that they're just gonna tell me to lose weight and that's all they ever tell me and that's been my whole life and I expect to feel shamed, maybe I'm not gonna go to the doctor. Um, we find that in the weight-centric approach, we see disordered eating patterns appear, we see increased shame and guilt, we see people abandon new behaviors due to failure. And the failure is in quotes because it's a, it's a situation of perspective that people see, um, you know, that they've, uh, you know, I've got to follow this exact caloric range for the day. And if I go over it, that's a failure. And if they fail, they're less likely to continue. Um, the flip side is also true. Maybe I'm going to try to eat more flexibly. And I, um, you know, I feel like I fail that because I've, um, you know, overeaten or, you know, something didn't feel quite right or perfect. So there's a high rate of um, abandonment. And then there's also reduced attunement with body cues. If I'm eating based on what this app says that I should be doing versus what my hunger fullness is telling me, I'm not going to be in touch with my hunger fullness. But from a Hayes perspective, um, there's an appreciation for body diversity. We see reduced um, aspects of some of these other things that people are less um, likely to engage in disordered eating patterns. They have more self-compassion. They're choosing sustainable behaviors versus holding themselves to these unrealistic standards, and they have more attunement with their body cues. So when we think about looking um, at ourselves and our own practices as clinicians and thinking, how can I be more weight inclusive? Um, this is a, a really great kind of graphic that gives you a full circle of perspective of all the dimensions of health that, that we can assess to think about 
Um, how is a person doing? How healthy are they um, outside of just their weight? So certainly their physical aspects, their vital signs, their lab works, nutrition and hydration status, hormonal health, right? There's a lot of physical things on here, but it also zooms out and looks at things like, how do you actually feel? Um, what a novel idea to ask the patient how they actually feel. How are they sleeping? How are their relationships? Um, what is their environment and SES status look like? So really zooming out and thinking about the person as a whole person allows us to put less focus on weight and um, come at it from a weight-centric approach. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but language is really important when we're moving toward a weight-inclusive approach, like a haze-aligned approach. Um, so instead of overweight or obese, we can use words like larger body or higher weight. Um, instead of talking about an ideal weight, we can just say, matter of fact, your weight is blank. Um, for um, food, like if we're going to describe different types of food, so especially for you dietitians out there, um, instead of using the word tempting, we might use the word nourishing. Instead of the word dangerous, we might use the word crunchy. Um, instead of good, we might use satisfying. And you can tell there's no real correlation here because that's, that's true for food. Food can be all of these things. Um, delicious, appetizing, you know, cr crispy, right? It's just adjectives. And so if we can take the emotion out of the way that we're talking about food and we can stay away from good, bad, clean, dirty, dangerous, healthy, all these types of um, really polarized language, we move toward making a safer space for our patients. We need to monitor for our own biases. For example, changing a meal plan based off weight gain alone. That's something I think that a lot of clinicians struggle with, especially our, our dietitians who are prescribing meal plans. Um, if the meal plan is not supposed to create weight gain and weight gain happens, there may be the urge to lower the meal plan to try to keep the weight, the weight gain from continuing. Um, and, and weight gain might not be a bad thing. It might not be a sign that something is going wrong. Um, that might just be the person's normal, like happy place where their body is okay um, and wants to be. So we have to notice that type of a bias. Another bias um, might be not providing all interventions to a patient who has atypical anorexia versus um, kind of the traditional anorexia. So if someone has atypical anorexia, they're usually starting from a higher weighted place and losing weight, but there's some really good research out there that people who have atypical anorexia versus traditional anorexia are no less ill um, psychiatrically or physically. So we have to take both of those diagnoses seriously um, and treat them exactly the same way. Another bias might be assuming an ED diagnosis based off how someone looks. So assuming that you know, that person must have a restrictive eating disorder or that person must have a loss of control eating disorder based on how they look. Another bias could be assuming larger bodied clients are chaotic, lazy, et cetera, all of those types of kind of cultural diet culture um, beliefs that we have negatively about people who are in larger bodies and that we have to work to notice and change. And then lastly, avoiding prescribing a beneficial medication just because they may cause weight gain. Um, so anytime that the weight in and of itself is what's motivating our decisions, um, it's something to kind of pause and step back and think about. We can also as clinicians focus on health promoting behaviors. So things like does this food actually satisfy you? Maybe it checks all the boxes on your meal plan, but was it good? Did you like it? Did you like how it tasted? Is this something that you could see yourself eating again? Um, things like emotion regulation skills, enjoyable movement, getting enough sleep, attending medical and ther therapy appointments. These are also part of that whole person perspective. And when we can talk about all these different types of things, rather than just whether the weight went up or it went down, we are moving toward a health uh, and weight inclusive approach. We all must practice what we preach and keep learning. 
Um, so we have to kind of do this to ourselves in order to really be authentic, I believe, in doing it with our patients. Um, thinking about what you have on your own social media feeds and is it time to kind of unfollow some people or stop supporting or um, keeping up with influencers or pages that aren't um, health at every size aligned? What are we reading? What are we listening to? What blogs are we following? Um, looking at our own photos. You know, if I'm gonna post a photo of myself on social media, am I editing it first? Um, am I using fat talk or fat shaming comments in my own life? If I'm, am I trying to educate the people around me, my friends and family about fat talk and fat shaming comments and using health at every size principles? So I really believe that all of us, when it comes to diet culture, are swimming in the same soup um, and we have to kind of start start at home first and think about how our own biases are showing up. When we have, uh, if we're seeing patients or clients in person, we also want to make sure that our physical setting and our materials are inclusive so that we're representing all genders, body sizes, eating disorders in our, our you know, if we have a flyer, we have pictures on our website and then our, in our office that we have comfortable furniture for all body sizes. So as a summary, um, weight stigma is extremely harmful. When we focus on values aligned behaviors, it can help increase patient self-efficacy. We can change behavior to promote positive outcomes regardless of a change in weight status and everybody deserves respectful care. So with that, we've got some resources here at the end for you all um, and then our references. And I think it's time for some Q&A. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you, um, Jennifer and Landry for that. That was incredible. Um, yeah, we'll go ahead and leave those resources up there. And if anyone attending wants to take a picture with your phone, you're welcome to do that to keep track of those. Um, so we did have some great questions come through. Um, the first one is directed um, specifically to Joanna. And this person says, what do you think are the best questions to ask young people to explore their relationship with food and assess for eating disorders? So it seems like maybe they're wondering, what do you think could have been helpful for you to hear? Or what kind of questions do you think maybe would have helped you when you were younger? Um, I think that something that would be helpful is to not automatically assume just like Landry um, had mentioned, you know, not automatically assuming that because somebody is in one specific body type that they automatically are associated to certain things. Um, I mean, even today, I still receive that from going into doctor's offices. Um, I still get that, that bias, um, that assumption that, um, and I think that that would be something as a kiddo, um, you know, I, being a kid, you know, you look to your parents to be your advocates. Um, and, you know, my mom obviously was doing the best thing that she thought was right for me. Um, and when you're being told by a medical professional, you know, they could have potential um, things down the road if this isn't addressed at a young age. Um, you know, she saw that, you know, as any parent, I'm assuming would, I'm not a parent, so I can't speak to that, but I'm assuming that, you know, you would do obviously anything for your kid and to make sure that they have the best possible life ahead of them. And I think that something that would have been helpful is to not make those assumptions that um, just because a child is a certain weight um, that they are automatically disposed or predisposed to certain things, um, as well as not starting that diet talk at such a young age. Um, I mean, I remember doing my very first diet with my mom as young as like eight years old. Um, I did Atkins, you know, it was cutting out carbohydrates and starting that precedent at such a young age of the idea of bad food versus good food, of putting certain foods on a pedestal, um, you know, instilling those 
ideas into kids when kids should not be worrying about what they're eating during the day or what caloric intake they have. They should be worried about what Ninja Turtle they're going to be or what, you know, like those are the things that kids should be worrying about, not 20 years from now, what medical condition might I have if I don't start putting all of this effort into making sure that I'm watching what I eat when I'm five years old. Um, so I think that we really need to start putting a bigger focus on letting kids be kids um, and not putting them on diet medication at eight years old, not having the diet talk at such a young age, um, and maybe putting a bigger focus on nourishing our bodies and making movement be movement and finding you know, that joy in moving our bodies versus punishing our bodies. Um, and starting that dialogue at a young age would have been really helpful versus setting the precedent of what pretty much was the whole rest of my life until I went to treatment um, of bad food, punishing my body, doing these things to be able to be worthy of anything based on what society has told me. That was incredible. Thank you. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, I think the next one's for Jennifer specifically. This person says, why do dietitians use the word diet instead of a nutrition plan? I completely agree. Like diet is the word die with a T on the end. And it, I really wish we could banish it from our our word choices and it is unfortunately the word we commonly use even if we mean just it's the way that we eat and i think it's just going to take a big shift to get out of using that term uh, something we promote at the eating recovery center is the word meal plan versus diet as your overall food intake so I think it's on us as dietitians to start changing the language. Yes. Okay, this next one's for, I think, Jennifer or Landry. Um, they say, I work at a PHP level of care for eating disorders and often get asked by uh, clients if they can reverse the negative side effects they got from dieting or, or engaging in their eating disorder. I know it's hard to say, and some are reversible, but what have you seen from a higher level of care perspective? I can, I can try to take a swing at this one. Um, you know, I think every body is, is different, truly. Um, you know, the good news is that when it comes to eating disorder behaviors, the large, the large majority of the side effects that we see physically are reversible. So there's a lot of hope to be had. Um, you know, we do see that, um, Certainly it, it's different for different people. It's different in terms of, um, you know, the length of time they've engaged in the behavior, the types of the behaviors that they've engaged in. But from a physical perspective, by and large, um, things, you know, do pretty much reverse with recovery. Um, so I think there's a lot of hope and encouragement around that, that I always want to make sure that people know. Um, you know, I think like Joanna spoke about this as well, the, the idea that like, you know, you have the thoughts maybe that still come up or you might see something on social media and there's, you know, maybe um, it, it might strike you or bring something up in you. And so I don't, I, I'm a big believer that we can't unlearn what we know, you know, there's no delete button in our brains. And so when we've had an experience, we carry that with us. Um, and so I usually prescribe to like an acceptance and commitment therapy kind of approach that like, I, I, I can't control the thoughts that I have. My brain is a thought machine. It makes thoughts all the time. What are my values? What's important to me? And in this moment, what can I do that moves me toward my value versus away from it, regardless of the thoughts that my brain is sending my way. Great. Um, 
then for Jennifer or Landry, I guess, or Joanna, anyone, um, can you recommend any workbooks or books that help clients have a positive relationship with food? So I know we have books listed on this slide. I don't know if you want to highlight maybe some that specifically help kind of shift the language around food. From a dietitian perspective, intuitive eating, I think, is like one of those gold standard books for that weight inclusive, food neutral approach that once, like if we're not talking about somebody working through an eating disorder, but just somebody who's trying to overcome diet culture is really something that can be life changing for the better and just really help a person find so much freedom with food. Someone with an eating disorder can absolutely eventually get to intuitive eating, but that is going to be a very long-term goal because the eating disorder took away that person's ability to eat intuitively at that point in time. But with time, with meal planning, with structured eating, the person can eventually return to intuitive eating. Yeah, I agree. perfect. I was oh, just go gonna ahead. say, oh no, it's okay. I was just gonna say, I agree. I also think not just from a, a patient standpoint, but I also, I know that my mom also read the Art of Intuitive Eating while I was going through treatment. And so from a caretaker or a loved one's point of view also, I think that it's really beneficial and helpful um, to be able to not only kind of understand the language that your loved one will be using, um, because, you know, you are trying to shift and create those new pathways for the way of thinking from what you had been talking, um, the dialogue that you use. And so not only from a standpoint of understanding the language that they use, but also, you know, from for a personal standpoint to kind of, you know, we all have our own um inner dialogue in the the what society has taught us what you know the what how we perceive certain things and so it, it was really beneficial from my mom as a loved one of somebody to be able to help understand what i was learning in treatment and moving forward how she could help me um, maneuver through learning and reteaching myself how to be an intuitive eat, intuitive eater and what that looked like um, from somebody as a caretaker kind of point of view. Yeah, yeah, great feedback. Um, another question, if a young adult has been in a restriction and never reached their true usual healthy weight, would you recommend, recommend using BMI, Hamley, or something else? Growth charts are always the most helpful, most individualized piece of data that we can get our hands on. Now, the question said, what if the person has always been underweight? And we do see that from time to time at the Eating Recovery Center. That uh, often presents itself in our patients with ARFID. And so really, there's so much more research to be done on this topic. And what we know right now is if they have fallen off even that low growth, like that lower end growth curve, we've got to at minimum get them back to that growth curve, even if it was the 10th percentile or maybe even the fifth percentile. They may have gone down to the first percentile potentially um, amongst, I mean, I could give you a million other examples but still getting them back up to that normal 10th percentile still may not be enough. And then that's where we use our clinical judgment. Sure, we could run BMI, sure we could maybe run Hamway depending on the age, but we all know that those aren't perfect calculations. They are far from perfect calculations. So really what we're looking for instead are things like, what does their blood work look like? Do they have normal, glucose levels, do they have normal kidney functioning, liver functioning, et cetera? Do they have normal hormone levels? Are they eating appropriately? Are they living their life? Um, are they able to adjust and be flexible? Or is there so much rigidity still around food? Because if that rigidity is still present, what that tells us is that the brain still has more nourishment to achieve 
to get to a place of overall health. So we would sometimes then consider, okay, maybe let's try to help support an, a few more pounds of weight restoration or weight gain and see what the outcome is. Thank you. Um, so I know we're ending on our time here. I wanna have one last question for Joanna, which is, you know, if someone was sharing with you that they were um, really struggling and kind of at the beginning of unlearning diet culture and um, just the harmful messages, what is something you might say to them? I think it's, oh, that's hard. Um, it's a, it's a lot of unlearning, um, and a lot of repeating and repetition of what I know to be true, what versus what I have been quote unquote taught to be true previously, um, or the idea of this is, this is how things should be. Um, this is what's safe. This is what isn't safe. Um, and so I think it's really having that continuing dialogue of, um, and I hate saying this terminology, I mean, but the fake it till you make it, like continuing to whether or not at the beginning of my recovery, I believed it or not. I knew that the other wasn't true and that I needed to continuously use the other way of thinking and dialogue. Um, and then that eventually started to stick and I started to really truly believe it to my core. And so now, you know, at the beginning of my recovery, I would really have a hard time with hearing people talk about diets or, you know, reading things about new diets or diet culture. Um, and, you know, I even, you know, on a personal level, like my brother has been talking about, you know, Ozempic and Manjaro and all of those, all those things. And for me, you know, I'm really torn on it because, you know, there are two sides to it, I feel like. And, um, and so it's, it's really sticking to what I know in my heart to be true. And so I, my biggest thing would just be to continue to have that inner dialogue with yourself, um, that, that this is, this is my new truth and that this is my um, new reality. And the more and more that you have that, the more and more you begin to believe it and it starts to take over that previous way of thinking. And I also feel like the more that I help to educate those around me, whether or not it goes in one ear and out the other, whether or not they think that I'm completely full of, you know what, um, that's fine. That's on them. I still know what my truth is. And I feel like that new dialogue is more my core and more of a core value for me than the other ever had been. And it actually serves me and gives me purpose versus versus the other. So just continuing to have that dialogue, continuing to have that dialogue with other people too, and to help educate, um, I think has been really helpful and was helpful for me on the receiving end when I was first in treatment. Um, so. Thank you. I think that's a great way to end um, the presentation today. So thanks again to Joanna, Jennifer and Landry and to Oklahoma Eating Disorders Association for supporting us in this and helping us spread the word about it. Um, please check out their website, as I mentioned, um, to get involved. And um, hopefully we'll see you at another event soon. Thank you all.